Okay, so welcome uh, everyone uh, to our session of the uh, seminar on mixed methods and mixed data research. Um, just a quick reminder about uh, the series. This is a reflection on mixed uh, methods and mixed data research, and it is meant to be a platform for open discussion and exchange about uh, a number of issues, methodological, conceptual, and practical. For some reason, we have uh, uh, more um, uh, contributions from the social sciences, but by our we are by all means not restricted to the social sciences. Uh, this is our fourth session. In the first three sessions, we looked at data, qualitative and quantitative data, and we examined how quantitative data need some kind of process of qualification and uh, conversely, qualitative data needs uh, some kind of process of quantification. And so we saw these two things as pretty much as uh, uh, the, the two sides of uh, a same uh, coin or certainly as being closely uh, related. And uh, after these two first session, we had a third session on data, which was more focusing on the nature of, uh, of data. And now somehow from questions of nature of data, we go on to questions of uh, size. So there is uh, normally a division across uh, research styles and disciplines, depending on the, the number of cases, the number of variables used as an, as an explanation. And so this is where we think of the small n or the big n. And now, of course, um, the trend is to try and do as many n as possible and we get to the to the big data but we would like to discuss with you today whether this conventional separation between small intermediate large big research makes uh, uh, sense uh, at all, whether it is meaningful, uh, whether more is always better, if so, why? If not, uh, uh, why not? Um, and uh, perhaps uh, an interesting addition today is uh, there is uh, a lot of discussion of uh, big data that comes from uh, quantitative oriented disciplines or those disciplines that have adopted quantitative methods like the social sciences. But today we have a contribution from the humanities, computational history of ideas, that is not uh, an area that you would normally associate with, uh, with big uh, uh, data. Um, so uh, this brings me to our two panelists. As usual, we will begin with the pitches from uh, two experts in uh, on the field in the field and then we will open uh, the discussion uh, to the whole group we have with us today Arianna Betti who is the chair of philosophy of language at the philosophy department and at the ILLC the institute for logic language and computation and Arianna is also leading um, a project funded by the MVO uh, titled the e ideas and it is uh, uh, a computational approach uh, in the history of ideas and then we have with us uh, Rick Quax and he's a computer scientist at the computational science lab at uh, the UVA and his research is focuses on complex systems and specifically on information theory as a way to explain emergence of complex system uh, behavior. So we haven't coordinated beforehand, so I don't know whether uh, there would be a natural order in the presentation. So I suggest we go alphabetically just uh, kind of for, uh, for a change and see uh, what happens. Um, Arianna, you have the floor about uh, five minutes and uh, you start whenever you are ready. Okay, so uh, thanks for the invitation. As uh, Federico said, uh, my field is computational history of ideas or data-driven uh, history of philosophy of philosophical ideas, if you will. Uh, what is big data for me? Um, so first of all, you do this. So what I'm doing, uh, scaling up what traditional humanities researchers do only for skill. So if you want to know the deep meaning of one page of text, you're not going to use computational methods. But if you want to use to know the context of that page, and that content, uh, that context being as big as, as possible or as big as, as you wish, then, then the computational methods kick in. And what is big data? So you have to think that, so for typical computational experts, big data is really much, much bigger than for us. For us, big data is something like 10,000 pages of text or say all the collection um, 
or the production, the academic production of philosophy during lifetime, or say a thousand books published in a certain period. So what is larger, what is small is really domain dependent, I would say. Uh, this creates also a lot of problems for the type of tools that you are allowed to use uh, or, or, or you can profitably use. But some of these techniques are really such as text mining or, or you know, your last question, Federica, about machine learning. Well, for those type of tools, size really matters and that's the size of computational uh, aspects in general. So big, big, big data and not mine. So that's the first thing. I do not know any actual, uh, as I say, it's domain dependent and many of these domains, they enter computational experiments. Um, uh, right now, they are pioneering that approach. Uh, these are questions that I don't see answered. Uh, there are other questions that are very pressing and are not, I don't see answer, not even within computational domains themselves, such as the idea of a similar corpus, right? So if you work with text, and that's that's what I do, um, very often to, to work sensibly with uh, computational tools, you, you really need um, to be able to generalize them or know what tools really work best with your type of text. And then your type of text um, then goes very much immediately into the idea of similar corpora or, or similar. And, and the question is size is one aspect of it, but really it, it's one of those things that people don't seem to know. And people are talk really in general, even you know, within computational uh, fields. So, um, what do you do? We, do I achieve with big data that I don't achieve with small data? For in my case, it's really evidence. Simply, the possibility of enlarging the body of evidence for me means that wide scope claims that are accepted in my field um, far too quickly, such as oh, uh, the the notion of conceptual scheme was uh, you can find it anywhere in the philosophical science of the 50s and the 60s. Well, these type of claims have been forever accepted because the expert says so, but without any real quantitative or, or, or computation, without data, basically, without evidence. So for me, the possibility of checking and having hypotheses of these type of claims, the wide scope claims that, that are normally done in the field, um, is, is the reason to go for big data, large in the body of evidence, big in my sense. Um, so the, what's the, what, how do you go about big data if your field is in fact the typical humanities field where people painstakingly analyze, uh, agonize on a page of text? Well, the, the, the point here is that what, what, my perspective on this is that, well, that's the challenge, the scaling up of this, the type of understanding and the type of perspective that, that people take when they read a text. How do you scale it up? How do you keep the type of more qualitative aspect when you go big? That's a very challenging question. Uh, it depends very much on the type of tool you're using. The answer is, is not good for every type of tool that you use. But say the, the type of tool that you had in mind when you asked the last question again to the machine learning type, those uh, and, and how much uh, you, you, you actually can help or aid the machine qualitatively, well, you can, but the, the mutual, and you have to, it's kind of a trivial point to make because while well, machine learning is basically, uh, it, 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 it's a technique in which you give a bunch, a smaller bunch of curated labeled, labeled data and a machine extrapolates or, you know, finds more of the same. But this idea of more of the same is very unclear. Um, first of all, more the same in what sense? Um, should the example itself that is given to a machine to, to, make, to, to give you a kind of characterization of the type of thing you, are, you want the machine to do? Uh, but that, that's a challenging thing. Um, and, and I would say that here, depending on the size, uh, the key would be to retain control of what a machine does and at, at what point of the output of a machine you can still steer qualitatively what's going on. You know, it, it's, a, it, it's a kind of variation on 
open a black box if you're using tools that in, in fact do uh, use a black box type of approach to, to, to data. So that's a couple of uh, ideas from, from my field um, where the mixed methods are absolutely fundamental. Without a mixed method, I could just you know, not do this. It wouldn't make any sense. That was my time. Perfectly on time. Thanks, Ariana. Maybe before we move to Rick, can you just give uh, an example of an hypothesis that you analyze uh, in uh, with your approach so that people get a better sense of uh, the kind of thing that you would study? Yeah, so one thing that actually qualifies as quantitative without being computational, but still quantitative, is um, whether the idea of the concept or conceptual scheme was a Harvard-born idea whether the, the, the kind of environment that Harvard was in the 20s was when this idea was born and then it spread. So this type of thing, so the spread of a concept and when it was born and why, it is the type of thing that lends itself very, very nicely to this. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will continue after uh, Rick. So Rick, the floor is yours whenever you're ready to start. All right, how much time did I have? Uh, five to seven minutes. Five to seven minutes, okay. So um, we'll do my best. I don't have uh, the same alarm, so uh, I'll just have to wing it. Um, so maybe first a little bit of background. Uh, so what we try to do in the computational science lab is, um, uh, is two things. One, is, uh, so we analyze complex systems. It could be um, any domain. For now, and there's different researchers working on different domains, but the common denominator are two things. One is we try to make new types of mathematical or computational models, and so these are quantitative. Uh, and the second is try to develop new analysis methods and to understand those models and the outcomes of those models and to translate that to the domain. Um, and all of our projects, we work together, of course, with the domain experts because we are not the 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 people who own the knowledge needed for that. Um, and yeah, my contention for uh, the topic today is that um, the quality of more or less uh, on data is not the only quality that we need. It's also how much information is contained in that data or in each data point. Because it could be that you have lots of data, but that those data points are not informational, meaning that they don't help me much uh, zooming in on the precise model that I need to make. Uh, so to give an example, uh, one of our projects is on organized crime. Uh, we work together with the national police for that. And they have data sets containing millions of records of um, which person met which other person when, uh, which person um, owns which car, uh, blah, 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 et cetera, um, which person was arrested when, what for, together with whom, and things like that. Um, but these are um, sparse observations over many years. Um, most of the organized crime is, of course, uh, hidden. But most importantly, what we are looking for are rules of dynamics. Eh? So each agent, when do you do what? And those observations, such as these two people happened to be arrested together, they don't give me much information about what they were doing um, or why they were found together. Um, often I don't even know what their role is in the, uh, in the, in the market. So maybe one of them is a, a trader and the other one is uh, an investor in, in crime, but typically I don't know, they are just arrested. So even though I have millions of records, and in principle, I could train all kinds of machine learning algorithms on those millions of records uh, for the goal that I have, making models that are dynamic uh, and that are um, causal eh, in the sense that I can, for instance, simulate scenarios where I do an intervention and I would like to learn, eh, for instance, did I disrupt a, a criminal network or not? Um, for those types of questions, that data is not useless, but it's, uh, it's very minimal eh, how we can use that. So what we're doing in that project is uh, collaborating a lot with uh, people on the team that are uh, anthropologists, uh, criminologists, um, uh, analysts, to try and find out um, 
what are the rules of dynamics? And we try to treat that also as data. And so as normally we would train a model on data, experimental data, for instance, uh, but now what we try to do is interview these experts in some structured way, such that their statements can also be used as data uh, that we can use to train the model. Um, and we also need statements from the experts, for instance, to um, validate our model. And we, also, we always need to do validation of models. Uh, so the statements that they give us for validation, we call validation statements, and the statements they give us for training are training statements. Uh, and we need to be very careful uh, about separating these two things and um, the set of experts that we interview. Um, but that we call qualitative data. Um, and our, <clears throat> or at least if I speak for myself, uh, my goal is to, to keep doing this. And so to find domains where uh, perhaps there is data, but it's not enough. And in order to make a, a holistic model, uh, so that takes into account all the different processes that are there, social processes, economic processes, uh, inequalities plays a role, the, the number of dysfunctional families uh, with multiple complex uh, issues uh, plays a role. And, all these things we try to put into one model because uh, we want to find out the big picture. Uh, but on that big picture, it's always the case that perhaps on small parts we have data, but it will never be enough. Um, and even getting more data of the same doesn't help us. Um, and getting data on all parts of the system is not feasible. So our approach at the moment in multiple projects, for instance, also Alzheimer's disease, going all the way from population and individual level all the way down to molecular level. We're also making a, 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 a conceptual model at the moment of that. It's impossible that we find data sets on all possible links that we have in that model. So, um, and the same for di diabetes type two. So what we need is to combine somehow the quantitative data that we have on small parts yeah, where people happen to make cohort studies uh, and things like that, but combine that with the qualitative data. Um, but this qualitative data needs to be informational as well. So that would be my contention. And that's, you know, how do we interview people to get data that is for us informational? For instance, simple example, if I would ask someone, in a training uh, set, I would ask, for instance, someone, uh, does glucose lead to a low-grade inflammation in beta cells? Um, and somewhere in the validation statements, it says um, um, uh, an important factor for uh, beta cell degradation is uh, glucose uh, levels, uh, uh, hyperglycemia. Then I'm not validating because this statement is 90% is the same as my training. Uh, statement. But how do I make sure of this? Eh? Because normally with data, I can split the data, uh, training and test, and eh? that's what we usually do. And we know, okay, these are separate. But for qualitative data, you know, we're running into issues like this. How are we going to make sure that we still uh, get lots of information out of the experts, eh? the, out of the basically the minds of the experts that have maybe, you know, decades of experience um, in a way that is useful and um, informational for building our models. So, and this is an ongoing proce process. So we recently uh, uh, were accepted for an article on, you know, describing a, a procedure on how to do this. Um, and I think I can, I can share that um, at some point very soon with, um, with Federica perhaps, and then maybe you can spread it in the community uh, if you're interested, uh, but that's also, uh, uh, we're making uh, more work on this path because we think that this is uh, really important. And so my final remark would be that um, and this link between qualitative and quantitative, I think is absolutely essential in complex systems um, science because I visit the complex systems um, uh, conference every year. It's the largest conference on complexity theory, complex systems, uh, whatever you call it. Um, most people there are quantitative by far, and the models that are studied are typically one of a very small number. Uh, Ising spin models, a few game theory examples, uh, 
some very small uh, uh, low dimensional um, differential equations, for instance, for bounded rationality of agents in economic markets or something like that. Um, it's very typical that you have such models. Why? Because uh, those are easy to analyze. But if you then say, oh, uh, yeah, um, you know, the social process of someone deciding to go into crime is also a complex uh, system or type two diabetes. Yeah, very complex system, multi, multi scale, multi domain. But no one makes the effort to try and make a model there. Yeah? It's too difficult. Uh, and then I think, yeah, I could maybe spend my career analyzing Ising models, uh, or I can try to bridge this gap. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's we took the hard road. <laughs> We're trying to bridge this gap. Um, and I can also say we need lots of uh, help with uh, doing that. So uh, uh, that's 50% of the reason uh, why I'm here. Um, well, that, I think that's um, I think that concludes my pitch. I hope it was. Thank coherent. you so much, uh, Rika. We have uh, plenty of uh, ideas uh, to discuss now. I would have a list of questions, but I, I first want to give uh, the floor to uh, uh, the other people in the group. Please uh, raise your uh, uh, virtual hand uh, if you want to ask a question or make a note in the chat. And. Uh, while I wait, oh, Adam, you have a question, please. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions to, to, to Ariana. Uh, thank you for, for, for all those remarks. And uh, I, my first question uh, is about errors uh, in, in doing such a, a kind of research that you are uh, doing because of course errors we can find and appears in every kind of research but I have this impression that here in all big data especially in all automatic uh, process data research it is more difficult to control the appearance of this kind of errors and to eliminate them because the scale is different because we are not doing everything by ourselves etc okay so I, I would like to ask you about comment and how you deal with the, the, the this problem of errors and the second um, question or, or rather maybe comment uh, uh, concerns the, the issue of languages, because, of course, in the case of large languages like English, uh, mm -hmm. both because we have more developed research, better prepared tools, more data, but also it is dealing with, you know, simple uh, grammatical structures. So that is easy, but in other languages, on the other hand, uh, it is more difficult to conduct such a research because we don't have uh, such a good, I don't know, reference database, number of digitalized materials that can be studied, or there are, of course, certain uh, grammatical problems uh, referring to conjugation by cases and things like that. And then the all automatic processing of such a text uh, is just just not so simple okay you have more work uh to do and i have this impression that um, paradoxically this kind of research reproduce uh the center periphery geopolitical division uh on this uh, level of of uh large scale research okay um should I reply, Federico, do you want? Yeah, yeah, go so ahead and reply, and then we take more questions. I start from the second. So, yes, the danger of simply because the tools work better for English, uh, yes, the danger of reproducing this kind of um, uh, Eurocentric or, or, or language centric or English Anglo centric uh, research is there. But um, you know, that does not mean that, and especially it's on us, so the people of the humanities can do that, can really, by creating the demand and creating the cool data sets that people in the in computer science want to have because it's a cool new areas of research, it's up to us to come up and say, hey, we are there. I do research on Armenian, I, I want that. Then you know you would have people that 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 are gonna 
especially if you have a group of users that are very cooperative and can interact with computer experts, you know, my experience is that it can work really, really well. So it's up to us to, to say, I want to do this. I want to go computational. What can I do? What are the tools? Uh, can someone help me um, adapt them? Uh, there are tools that do not depend. Uh, they are language agnostic, very much so, even text-based tools. Um, you can start with those. So I will use some of them. Of course, if your work is parsing, it depends on parsing, then you need parses that uh, for, uh, for English work, there are many and for other languages less, but it's a question of memory. So I don't see a big problem there, um, not essential at least. Uh, we just have to be a bit aware of it as well. The one of mistakes is interesting because, um, again, uh, that's part of what I say, like the control that you want to have as, as a humanities scholar. So there was a trend for a very long time in the humanities, in the digital humanities. So I prefer computational humanities because it gives a ring to, to I don't know, I mean, what I do is not reflecting on, on the tools only. Uh, within the humanities, but really interacting with the computer experts and making these tools and reflecting on them. How do you go with, with, with mistakes? So that's a problem in the sense that uh, it, it all depends on the type of tool and, and the type of mistakes we're talking about. Because if it's about, um, I don't know, it, it really it depends on, on the type of mistakes we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about, say, uh, the fact that um, tools that work perfectly fine without making any mistakes from the point of view of the tools, but from our point of view of the expected results, you're not getting expected results, then there there is a mismatch of expectations and, and of knowledge of what, what this tool actually is doing. The real mistakes um, <laughs> are of different types. Uh, you have human mistakes that come from working with inadequate tools to, uh, to the fact that there is miscommunication on what tools that are used uh, yield and checking them is difficult. It all depends on scale. So one way to obviate that, and that's what it's just been very, you need to be super careful. And the careful point is here, trying to do something at a human size scale, maybe a little bit more, but where there are many entry points for checking and only then scale it up. And don't start, as I say, with just throwing a bunch of data to a tool that you don't know very well. And then, then you don't really know where to start your error and analysis. There's error of different types. Uh, there is an entire discipline in computer science that do your error analysis. It's robustness, how robust the tool is, for instance. Assessment of error of that type is, is, is definitely even, you know, can be done mathematically. It really depends on the mistake. Thank you, Arianna. The last point that you mentioned seems to be very in line with what uh, Rick said about uh, quality of data and what you can get uh, out of them, but we have uh, two people uh, that raise their hands. I don't know if it is Naya or Morten who wants to ask a question. So please, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Federica. Um, so I have a question for, for Rick. Um, I think, uh, you know, this this integration and, and uh, you don't know me, Rick, but I do work a lot with uh, with data set. I'm, I'm a professor of epidemiology from, from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and I, we work with, you know, large uh, registry-based data, uh, so covering, you know, full population uh, data. Um, and I think this model building and especially your idea about integration of data in the models from quantitative and qualitative uh, is very interesting. And I have two, two questions re regarding that. One is, you know, if you start, and, and, and please, you know, um, um, you know, I'm, I might be, you know, partly ignorant here, but if you start integrating, you know, the, the qualitative interviews or your expert opinions as Oops, so Naya frozen, it's not just me because I see people yeah. staring and waiting. It was so a cliffhanger. It, yeah, so it is not on, on my side. Let's wait a few seconds. Maybe she comes back. No, looks like a problem with the hmm. connection is more serious uh, than just a uh... cliffhanger indeed. 
Okay, so I suggest that you to maybe ask your question and when Naya comes back, uh, she can uh, give us a summary of what she was saying because she may have not realized that she froze on our screen. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, like my predecessors, I have two questions. Uh, one for Ayana and one for Rick. Um, Ayana, my, my question to you is, uh, is, is rather uh, basic. Do you also attempt to build <coughs> causality into your explanations? Because at, at some point you said like I, I can detect how and where and when an ID emerged and, and I wonder if you can also use yes. computational techniques to, to say why they why they emerge and, and how you how you would do that. So that's my question to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, not directly. So the question is this is really what, if these tools help me now to understand the, the what and the how, then I'd be already very happy. It's just that there is a lot of work even to do that. The why is really like, so for instance, why a certain concept emerged, that is really the part that, that for now is, is, is the, most of it is really qualitative research, but that doesn't mean you cannot test such hypothesis by quantitative tools. You want, they want to emerge. It's not that that machine tells you why. But even the how and the what a machine doesn't tell. So it's just that the, the mix of qualitative and quantitative in the case of the why is very much, the balance is very much into the, the more qualitative part of it. It's like the amount of work that you do in theoretic hypothesis is, is very high. And then you can make something checkable by, by machines by using data that you can do. But you depend on the how and the what here. Is this helpful? I can add more, but is it, this helpful? It, it's, it's, very, it's very helpful and clarifying. I, I still wonder, so if you don't use computational techniques to infer causality, what, what do you use? Do you use- My traditional methods, my traditional methods, meaning, look, the, the links that are causal or explanatory, let's, let's talk about explanatory. So why certain, at a certain point, this concept uh, emerged and, and why did it change? You do your hypothesis, like you do also in other cases, you, you, you will why you study certain things instead of others. But let's say you do the hypothesis and then you make you, you have to make it amenable to, to machines by saying, well, the hypothesis can be tested as follows. If this bunch of data will reveal a certain result, then my hypothesis is partially corroborated, if not not. So, it's just that the pure part of the hypothesis building is going to be much more qualitative. And it's qualitative anyway. Um, so you need more steering in the case of the why. But you can definitely check and you can definitely you know, um, uh, fine tune hypotheses that can be at least partially checked by a bunch of uh, quantitative um, data results. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, used I, to say, I know you have it. Yeah, you have the second question, but Naya is back. So I would suggest that she finishes her question and then you are back to your, for your question to Rick. Okay. Thank That's you. Okay. So stay in, in the line. Oh, thank you. And, and I'm sorry, I don't know what happened with the, with the, with, with the, with, with the internet here. Anyway, uh, and I don't know how much you heard, but I'll, I'll, I think I'll start uh, from the beginning of my, my question. Is that okay, Federica? Yeah, yes. Um, anyway, so so first of all, uh, this was a question for for you, Rick, uh, on your you know integration, primarily the integration of the qualitative and quantitative data into the model, which I think is very interesting. Um, and my one question is really about you know how you um, how you treat the qualitative, and and maybe this is you know really my my ignorance. I normally work with you know uh, quantitative data myself, but I think one thing that is very important and that we sometimes tend to not uh, put sufficient um, focus on is, and also for the quantitative data, to, to be honest, is the uncertainty that goes into data. How do you treat uncertainty and how do you treat uncertainty in terms of the qualitative data as well? Uh, because so, so we don't have, you know, that, that, and I think this is really important to think about the, the variation variation in in things um and how they, they they change and how you incorporate that that part so that's my one question the second question is to do with um you say you often lack 
specific data. And I'm just curious about your method in identifying the right data, because at least I, you know, at least from, from the environments, I know people tend to be very closely connected to the data they have in their institutions or in their, you know, their supervisors or whatever. So, so could we think about, you know, open science and data sharing much more, you know, systematically in, 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 in also in terms of model building in identifying, you know, data across the world maybe that could feed into specific models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, excellent questions. I think, uh, so the first one um, about uncertainty quantification, uh, UQ, um, I think that's tightly coupled to sensitivity analysis, uh, SA. Um, and I think both of these are integral parts of the whole procedure. They, they can, it cannot be different. Um, why? Because we found in a few projects, uh, Alzheimer, crime, uh, that we have multiple types of uncertainty left and that's because it's just because we try to be you know holistic or, or take the big picture uh, everything at multiple scales that we think is relevant we should take into account that leads to uncertainties about model structure you know is a really connected to b is it correlation or is it causation for instance maybe sometimes experts don't know um, other questions are um, uh, data, for instance, could be small amounts of data, so the parameters can maybe not be identified perfectly. And so there are multiple types of uncertainty. Um, and uh, that is, of course, and, and that is for such a type of model so large. And the amount of uncertainty is so large that basically with the model that we could make at that point, the answers are, let's say, useless. Because there will be maybe a prediction and then the uh, uncertainty range around that will be so huge that basically anything is possible. Like uh, tomorrow uh, it could be sunshine or there could be uh, an F5 uh, tornado coming by. Uh, who knows? Um, then, the que then the question would of course be, well, then why are we doing this, right? I mean, why are we making these types of models uh, if we cannot identify them? Um, well, my answer would be, because then we can go into the cycle, right? the, the usual uh, cycle that we all try to do. Um, if you pair uncertainty quantification, eh? so maybe a part you are uncertain about, should I go uh, left or should I go right? If I pair that with the sensitivity analysis, like does it even matter for my prediction whether I go left or right? If yes, then that would be a very good point for the next you know, either experimental setup, if that's possible, or maybe a qualitative study to find out is really, you know, A connected to B, for instance, or, you know, uh, some other, uh, is the parameter really two or five? Um, whatever, depending on the type of uncertainty, I think this could give direction to enter into a cycle that maybe we spend a long time making because such a model is not going to be there in a year. Um, and I don't think we should expect that uh, even after a typical NWO duration of four years, uh, NWO is our national uh, science uh, agency, uh, even then, you know, such a model is not going to be there. But um, this, I think it's the, the point for of, of these projects is to enter the cycle, but to enable the cycle, because at the moment, I think this cycle for this type of research is broken. It just stops somewhere and people are maybe working at different parts of the cycle, but we're not completing it one round uh, and that would be a major goal. Um, <clears throat> that's maybe my thoughts for question one. Um, for question two, um, yes, I think, uh, you know, ontologies or, or repositories for those, uh, for, for data sets and for, for concepts would be huge benefit because um, for instance, one of our postdocs, uh, Nadesh, Mirabet recently created a causal loop diagram for uh, type two diabetes, you know, including uh, things like cortisol. So, you know, biorhythm type of uh, things, uh, uh, brain, uh, parts of the brain uh, with hormone levels uh, and all the way down to uh, the, the beta cells, but all the way up to also uh, lifestyle choices. Um, it's a huge diagram. It's, it's uh, really impressive uh, what she has made. Uh, it was uh, recently uh, published. Um, but what she did was spend 
I think three years interviewing people from the medical centers, um, uh, sifting through the literature for either statements of experts or data sets. Um, and even then to you know, gather all those uh, literature studies with like, uh, you know, we analyzed uh, whether uh, cortisol has an effect on, uh, on, on something else, uh, to put that then in the big picture in a, in a good way uh, of one person who is not expert uh, on all the parts of this uh, diagram, I think it's just, is not the way to go. So if somehow, you know, we can share this burden and let the people who have the expertise uh, annotated in such a way that we can see in the whole diagram, which is huge, as, okay, we have parts that are well covered by data, but we also have cover, uh, parts that are not covered well by, uh, by data. And to get that picture at the moment, I would say it's just impossible. But I think, you know, to um, have a better way of completing this cycle, I think this is a necessary ingredient. So, yeah, I would, I would love that. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, the other thing is that ontology databases, uh, open data sets, things like that, they do exist, right? But somehow we don't connect. I, I think there are many of them. <laughs> That's problem number one. Uh, second, yeah, um, there are people working on ontologies, but I wouldn't know how to work with them. So there's also a gap there. Um, so yeah, I, I, there are some gaps. I don't know if there's techno, what type of technical versus um, non-technical challenges are there, but um, well, at least my statement is it's a necessary ingredient. We really need to do that. Okay, thank you, Rick. So we have two more people who would like to ask a question. Eustus, uh, now, please, uh, you had a second question for Rick. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so maybe some background to my uh, question. Uh, recently, there has been uh, a big concern over how algorithms are used in, in law enforcement and in policy generally. So, for instance, for, for the Rotterdam Act that I studied, the, the, the proportion of ethnic minorities is used as a, as a criterion to target neighborhoods. And similarly, in a, in a scandal around um, uh, Texas, the, the background of families what played a role in, in, in models. And I, I guess you can see sort of my, my question uh, coming. How, how do you deal with these sorts of situations? And I want to specify that. So there's one issue about the indicators uh, that you use. So there, there's simply a question of, of accuracy and bias. Uh, then there's also a larger question, which is more I suppose political, like the sort of crimes, for instance, that you would be able to solve. Um, we, we know that some populations are much more heavily surveilled than, than others. Um, so, so I wonder if you have given this as uh, some thought. And this also relates to the question about qualitative research. So from your um, presentation, I think that it's very interesting and, and also very impressive how you use qualitative research, but it's mostly to validate data and I, I wonder if you also use qualitative research to examine how your model is used in in practice and sort of what what it, what it misses and um and how it could be amended given that there is a, a sizable body uh, of literature on this topic mm -hmm. yeah excellent point um well first i must say um that i should admit that we don't do enough on that um, I think that, um, so we are aware of that. And for instance, that also depends a bit. So for instance, the, the diabetes project, we have data from different uh, population groups, um, like Surinamese or uh, Dutch or, or something like that. And there it seems accepted to do that because uh, the cortisol dynamics, for instance, are different um, or the risk for, um, cardiovascular disease uh, apparently is different uh, and people seem to accept that. But if we go to the crime project, people don't accept it, uh, that we use that as indicators or as part of the model. Um, yeah, so we, we, so we don't use it there. What I do tell people there is that if you remove data uh, or attributes, uh, necessarily our accuracy will go down. That's just... Um, it may stay the same if, for instance, uh, race or birth country or something like that, or a gender 
was totally irrelevant. Um, so that is a possibility, but it will never be the case that if we remove attributes from the data set, that we improve the accuracy of our model. That's impossible. So, um, so point number one that I try to convey to the people who are not the modelers, I say, we, uh, we need to uh, be careful about this and, and um, what should we remove, but be aware that our accuracies are going to go down. Um, the second is the much more difficult point, and this is a whole research field on its own, that for instance, uh, put it simply, if you have uh, Moroccan or Dutch, just the two, um, and you would remove that attribute, but you do have an attribute, for instance, uh, family size. Uh, it could well be that with 80% accuracy, you could impute back what was Moroccan and what was Dutch. So to be totally fair, I should also not train on family size. Uh, and if you, uh, I guess you can get the feeling that this can go as an oil stain over the data set. Uh, if you want to really be sure that you cannot identify people anymore or identify attributes of them. My feeling is uh, that we cannot use many, many attributes uh, because also combinations of attributes can be used to impute uh, values back uh, with high accuracy. Um, so for instance, there was 10 years ago or so, there was a study where people used data from like a central bureau of statistics uh, but removed things like where they lived um, and uh, other personal characteristics, but just from things like uh, how far do you live from work um, uh, and, and all kinds of other attributes. Uh, actually, it was possible to find back the identity of a large part of the data set. So what really is fair uh, in terms of modeling and in terms of the data? Uh, so in principle, I should not even have access to attributes that I shouldn't be using. And then my model, of course, should also not include them. Um, what is fair is a very difficult question. And I but, think- But Rick, sorry, sorry to interrupt. It yeah. would assume that ethnicity has a causal effect on crime rate. Because if that was not the case, then you would not need to consider it at all, no? Yes, it could either be a confounder or it could be a causal predecessor indeed. Um, in both cases, I think it's relevant to take into account um, but if for some reason, uh, for, for ethical reasons, we are not allowed to use it, it's, it's, out of, um, it's out of, let's say, the, the boundary, then yeah, what I tell people is that that's going to cost us uh, that if, we, if we cannot use it. That's just how it is. And I think most people also in the public debate, when you talk about it in a popular way or a colloquial way or in the new, you see it in the news, I think most people don't realize that this is the, um, the double-edged sword. And that, um, so for me, I'm perfectly happy eh, to, for me, it doesn't really matter. You know, if I get an accuracy of 70% uh, or 40%, if I trust my model uh, and, I, and I'm, I was able to complete the cycle, personally, I'm happy. But uh, I want to explain to people what is the consequence of the level of uh, fairness that you would like to achieve. That um, And I think that in reality, even people like me are ill-equipped to make sure that uh, before the data set leaves the national police and reaches my repository, uh, something should happen in between, which should not be me, that ensures the whole fairness question. Yeah? Because now what the police did is send me the thing and then ask me to make it fair. Yeah, okay, then... Even if, if I do this, uh, yeah. No, can, fin finish the sentence, Rika. Finish okay. the sentence. Uh, so yeah, so even if I do this, uh, we cannot show anyone that we've followed some proper procedure to to make this happen, uh, and I don't have the one hundred percent expertise to do it. Uh, I could go a long way, but uh, not all the way. So I think in projects like NWO EU, if we really want to do this, we have to include some phase in the project, initial phase, where other people with other expertises, you know, ensure this fairness before all of the other people look at the data sets and, and do the modeling and et cetera. And at the moment, that's totally not happening. But. Yep. 
Okay, thank you. No, this was getting very interesting and on uh, super hot uh, topics. But I think Judith had a question and then Arianna also raised her hand. Do you still want to ask uh, uh, your question, Judith, or uh, has it been yes, answered? As Arianna is a panelist, perhaps she can go first. Oh, no, no. I'm happy to. No, 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 no. Please, I Judith, ask your question. Before okay, then I then I then I'll ask my uh, question. Actually, I have a very uh, small remark uh, and a, a, a question. Oh, sorry, one moment. Uh, and both uh, uh, refer to Rick's uh, presentation uh, because what what struck me about the uh, idea of data uh, um, being informational that you need data that are informational. Uh, uh, because it's it's not only related to big data, uh, of which I do not know much, but also uh, it's an important principle, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, for qualitative research. So um, in qualitative research, uh, there's uh, some criticism to ground the theory in which it's especially the, the, the number of type times you you find the specific theme in your in your data uh, whereas there are other approaches where you really uh, look for say crucial information uh, albeit from one person that can really um, uh, steer the direction of your uh, of your uh, research and um, so also one small question would um, uh, would be uh, I would guess that um, uh, whether data are informational or not is something that can only be answered by the person who analyzes uh, these data because they are informational to, to him or her. Uh, and my, uh, my larger question is, um, as far as I understand, you also try to connect various levels. And uh, the question is whether that is possible, whether it's possible indeed, for example, to have a specific mechanism that transcends uh, borders of uh, uh, specific levels. I was uh, thinking about a book by uh, philosopher uh, Anne-Marie Moll, uh, who uh, really very convincingly demonstrated that such mechanisms uh, actually do not uh, do not work. So for example, the example she used was of uh, atherosclerosis, if I pronounce it well. Uh, and she said, well, if it would work, then you would expect that um, if someone has uh, such, such a block in their, in their artery, uh, that causes that they cannot walk. So if you would remove the block, then people would be uh, able to walk again. But that does not work because she showed that you can uh, remove the block in the artery and still people cannot walk or you can give them a walking training and then they are able to walk again but still have the block in their artery. So I was wondering how you are dealing with such uh, things. Thank you. I ask okay. you to be quick Rick so that we can take uh, the last question from Arianna. Um, okay so yeah, about uh, the last question, uh, for instance, uh, for me, that would be um, a question of, for instance, a temporal scale. I imagine an example where um, there can be low grade inflammation, uh, amount of inflammation in the body, for instance, from having uh, body fat uh, that induces low grade inflammation. And if you have that for, let's say, 10 years, uh, then let's say the amount of beta cells that you need for uh, the insulin um, and the glucagen uh, goes down, let's say by 10%. So that means that if I say now I have 10% less uh, beta cell, I, I can do less uh, you know, response to high glucose uh, peaks. Why? Because and that's now, eh? that's a question of now. I eat something, how much insulin do I have uh, in a, a few minutes from now? That's a very short uh, time scale question. But if I look back the causal pathway, how did this happen? It's because uh, 10 years long, I had this uh, inflammation. So yeah, that, that would be a time scale thing that we need to bridge somehow. Uh, I think maybe, I hope that makes sense. Um, the first question, could you remind me with two words what it was again? Um, whether it's not always the, the analyst who decides whether data I is informational or not. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I think at least um, yeah, so data 
being useful or not, or informational or not, or a lot or not, is not some, I, I think is not a question that can be only applied to a data set. I think it needs to be applied to the combination of a data set and an analysis that you would like to perform. Um, because uh, yeah, very simple example, if I make a graph with the three data points, uh, perfect vertically of each other, and you ask me to identify the X value, it's perfect. But if you identify, ask me to identify the Y value, it's imperfect, uh, I have many options. So um, the analysis will induce whether or not a data set is informational or not, uh, I think. Uh, so I think really these two ingredients need to be taken into account. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sorik and uh, Judith. Ariana, we, we have time for one quick question. It's very, very uh, quick. I was surprised that you said that you don't use ontologies. Uh, is it something you yourself don't do or the work that you do in, in this group or, or generally does not involve people that can formalize you know, and do formal ontologies? Uh, if, you're, if you're asking me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so actually we do have, in the same corridor, we have people that yeah. build ontologies uh, and, and try to infer them from uh, data and algorithms. And uh, and still, you know, five doors later, uh, you find us and, and we don't use ontologies for uh, connecting the data sets to the models. Uh, that's true, yeah. Yeah, so, and I think um, uh, some, somehow, that needs to happen, um, but I don't see an easy way how. It's, well, it's not uh, trivial to, to do that, I think. Well, yeah, I'm not saying that it's trivial. So first, ontology extraction is extremely difficult, but the modeling, any way you have a model, a data model of any kind of data, then you're doing, however rough, you're really doing an ontology, basically. So that's it's not so difficult. That's what I mean. The attraction is a different story, if you mean, from the data and ontology, of course, that's 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 really difficult, but I think it's it's wildly overrated. But the other way around, you know, really, you are actually using it already. I would I would suggest. That's why I was surprised. Mm -hmm. Okay, I suggest we leave it there because in the next thirty seconds, and we are already going over time. I would uh, like to uh, wrap up a bit because you may have the impression that we went in a different direction than the previous session, but I see at least two elements of continuity in what uh, Ariane and Rick said and in the questions that uh, came up. One is uh, the, the role of uh, researchers that uh, came up from time to time as an important uh, uh, element for the discussion. Uh, last time it was about the quality or the nature of data and this time it is about these modeling practices that we put in place. And even if you didn't put it so explicitly, I see it a recurring theme. And the second one is that uh, we concluded last time in saying that it was not a data as such the most important thing, but a kind of relations uh, that we have to look at. And this is again something that came up uh, in the pitches and in the questions uh, somehow. Now, so we are kind of building on the previous sessions and moving towards the next one in the in the next uh, in the in the following way. Now we kind of scaled up to the big, big data, but next time we will be looking at the uh, form or of the structure of these models that, that we'll build. So next session will be on syntactic and semantic uh, structures. And this has to do with how we work with these uh, uh, data. And we don't make an explicit stance whether it is qualitative or quantitative data. And so it looks like we are going to use them both just as Rick and Ariana said that they do on a daily basis that despite this uh, big uh, um, data, um, uh, not hype, but this big data, uh, this need of analyzing big data where there is still need for good quality of qualitative data uh, as well. Judith, you, you have your hand up because you want to say something quick. Please go and then I think we have to close. 
Yes, I want to make uh, an announcement and I just put it in the chat because uh, this summer, the 3rd and 4th of August, there will be the, the global conference of the Mixed Method International Research Association and we are welcome uh, any contribution. So in case you're interested, and I think much of what I heard in all sessions is very would be very interesting. Uh, so uh, I put uh, just the uh, URL mira.org and you can then uh, uh, send in, submit an abstract uh, before the 15th of March. Thank you. Thank you. Very relevant announcements. And so uh, please uh, do register for next uh, session in a couple of weeks. Uh, you will receive in any case uh, a reminder and we will let you know as soon as the, uh, the recording is uh, on the web. Thank you again uh, for your pitches, Ariane and Rick, and everyone for your present contributions uh, and uh, questions and uh, see you soon. Have a good uh, afternoon and weekend. Thanks. Right. Bye. Thanks Thank, you, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.